Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the UN Office on Drugs and Crime, I'd like to welcome you to this special event during the 14th United Nations Congress on Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice. As we are broadcasting live, I would like to wish you a good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are. And in particular, I'd like to thank those of you who are either getting up too early or staying up too late to join us. This means a lot to us. I'm joined today by a panel of very distinguished speakers, uh, two, well, several of them sitting with me here on the podium in Kyoto. Some we will visit live in their homes and offices and others who have taken crucial time in their schedules to record video messages. This truly will be, like the Congress, a hybrid event. Today our objective is to showcase our global programs, multi-dimensional contribution towards the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goal, particularly Goal 16, and building peace, justice, and strong institutions. This includes, of course, connections with other SDGs and their targets. Before we begin, however, I'd like to make a few announcements. Feel free to post questions in the chat area. One of our colleagues will compile them for a discussion at the end. And for those of you watching us online, we request that you keep your microphones muted and do not use your camera. This helps to improve the viewing experience for everyone. And I'd like to start this session by giving the floor to Ms. Gada Wale, who is our Executive Director of the UN Office on Drugs and Crime, and also the Secretary General of the 14th United Nations Congress on Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice. Ms. Wally. The floor is yours. Thank you, John. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us for this event on promoting the rule of law and justice to achieve the sustainable development goals. The theme of the 14th UN Crime Congress in Kyoto, namely advancing the rule of law, crime prevention and criminal justice to achieve sustainable development, takes forward the work of the 13th Crime Congress in 2015, which focused on integrating crime prevention and criminal justice into the wider UN agenda to address social and economic challenges. The outcome document of the 13th UN Crime Congress, the Doha Declaration, reflected the aspirations of member states to promote a more comprehensive approach to the crime prevention and criminal justice problems and encouraged a more nuanced understanding of the rule of law, challenges faced by all countries and regions. The 13th UN Congress provided a timely contribution to discussions on the post-2015 Sustainable Development Agenda and support to the landmark Sustainable Development Goals, in particular SDG 16 on fair, inclusive institutions of justice and the rule of law. Now, the 14th UN Crime Congress and the declaration adopted today have come as the world seeks to overcome and build forward from a global pandemic and get back on track to achieving the SDGs in the decade of action. On the road from Doha to Kyoto, the UN Office on Drugs and Crime supported member states to implement agreed recommendations and commitments and achieve progress between these two milestones, notably through the Global Programme for the implementation of the Doha Declaration. The Global Programme represented a new and ambitious effort to promote concrete follow-up to the Crime Congress and its declaration through legislative, policy and operational assistance, thereby transforming commitments into programmatic results. Launched in 2016 with the support of the State of Qatar, the program has delivered a diverse array of global projects and partnerships in its key priority areas of judicial integrity, prisoner rehabilitation, youth crime prevention through sports and education for justice. Through the development of tailored tools and resources made available to millions of beneficiaries, the global program has supported the work of educational, judicial and penal institutions around the world. Over the past five years, some 2.5 million people in over 190 member states have been reached by various initiatives. While more than 100,000 people have directly benefited from the support provided through more than 775 capacity building activities, the program's comprehensive people-centered approach to interconnected rule of law challenges built on UNODC's global expertise and extensive field presence to deliver assistance when and where needed, with a focus 
on national ownership to foster inclusive, resilient communities and promote access to justice with integrity and accountability. With integrated initiatives linking social development with the rule of law, the program also broadened its scope beyond technical assistance for crime prevention and criminal justice practitioners to encompass and engage new partners and stakeholders, most of all children and youth, who represent effective advocates for a culture of lawfulness and powerful agents for positive change. The Global Program has also worked and collaborated with diverse partners from the private sector, civil society and academia, including the Ban Ki-moon Center for Global Citizens, Facebook, Google, the International Association for Universities, the International Association of Women Judges, the Second Chance Foundation, FIFA, the UN Regional Commissions, UNESCO, UNFPA and UNRWA. This event will hear from some of these partners and the beneficiaries of the Global Program, and I thank those joining us for sharing their stories and perspectives. Panelists will also discuss responses developed during the global COVID-19 crisis, demonstrating how a continuum of action can be further maintained and strengthened through innovation and creativity. I am especially grateful to the young leaders of tomorrow who are taking part. Empowering young people and engaging youth in the work of UNODC represent key change enablers of the new corporate strategy we just launched for 2021 to 2025. And I encourage you to consider us your allies and to make your voices heard. I hope this discussion and the lessons learned inspire new ideas and partnerships, including to take forward implementation of the Kyoto Declaration together with UNODC as a key ally in supporting member states in the area of rule of law and justice. Going forward, UNODC remains strongly committed to advancing this partnership for the rule of law, as well as maintaining engagement in the areas where the global program helped to break new ground and propose new solutions to strengthen judicial integrity, support criminal justice systems to promote prisoner rehabilitation and reintegration, and empower children and youth through education and sports. I once again thank our partners at this event. I wish you fruitful discussions and a productive week at the 14th UN Crime Congress. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Executive Director Wally. I now have the pleasure to give the floor to our next keynote speaker, who literally without her, we would not be here today. Her Excellency, Ms. Yoko Kamikawa, the Minister of Justice of Japan, is hosting the, the 14th UN Crime, Crime Congress and serving as the president, but she was also the main inspiration for holding the conference and getting Japan to host the conference many years ago. And Japan has shown the world by hosting it here today that despite the COVID-19 pandemic, we will continue to find ways and means to promote the rule of law and work towards enhancing our crime prevention and criminal justice efforts to ensure a holistic and multi-stakeholder approach. So I have the pleasure to give the floor now to Her Excellency, Madam Minister, you have the floor. Thank you, John. Excellencies, distinguished participants, a good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to each of you participating in this event. Welcome to Kyoto. First of, first of all, I would like to thank Ms. Wally and the State of Qatar for hosting this very important event and inviting me to make a keynote speech. At the closing segment of the Doha Congress in 2015, I proposed hosting this Congress in Japan. The state of Qatar kindly supported my proposal. Since then, the state of Qatar has been a strong partner over the years leading up to this Congress. Since then, the state of Qatar has been our st strong partner. With this partnership, the Kyoto Congress has started this morning. I would like to thank again the state of Qatar and the UNODC for their continued support. Adopting the declaration is, of course, a difficult task. 
but implementation the declaration is even more difficult. A prominent legacy of the Doha Congress was a strong commitment and leadership of Qatar in the implementation of the Doha Declaration through its historical undertaking of the global program. I highly respect such efforts made by Qatar. Today, I promise that Japan will follow Qatar and strive to embark on this aspirational enterprise to produce tangible out outcomes with the Kyoto Declaration as the compass. In this regard, let me introduce Japan's ongoing initiative of Shihō Gaiko, in English, Justice Affairs Diplomacy. Japan has been providing technical assistance to build the capacity of civil and cri criminal justice. I believe it important that the fundamental values such as the rule of law and human rights prevail throughout the world. That is essential to realize just, peaceful and inclusive societies where all people can enjoy a safe and secure life. I have named this initiative of promoting such fundamental values across the globe as Shihō Gaiko and have been strongly promoting it. I believe the Kyoto Congress provides a turning point for justice affairs diplomacy. Through the follow-up of the Kyoto Declaration, we will accelerate our initiative of justice affairs diplomacy to promote the rule of law across the globe by the following actions. First, Japan will undertake to promote multi-stakeholder partnerships in our effort to prevent crime and bring justice in particular in reducing re-offending. In doing so, Japan proposes to member states the creation of a new UN standards and norms in reducing re-offending. Second, we will strive to empower youth and hear their voices in the field of crime prevention and criminal justice. Qatar hosted the first youth forum. It is very important to bring young people's voices Building upon the legacy of Qatar, we have organized a youth forum in the run-up to this Congress and will continue to hold youth fora annually. Third, Japan will take a lead to further promote international cooperation by supporting existing and creating new regional networks among criminal justice practitioners. Last year marked the 20th anniversary of our landmark convention of the United Nations Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime. But ratifying legal instrument is not enough. To achieve timely and effective international cooperation, fostering trust among authorities and addressing bottlenecks in the op operation through the common platform are necessary. Japan will take a lead to bring the cooperation to the next stage by supporting and creating such platforms. I would like to conclude my remarks by expressing my gratitude and respect, respect once again to the state and people of Qatar for their achievement. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Minister. And the purpose of our event today is to reflect on the achievements of the move from Doha to Kyoto and the program for the implementation of the Doha Declaration. It allows us to share tangible stories and actions with you today, including the beneficiaries 
of the work undertaken by the global program, which highlight the results achieved around the world so far. The reflection will also allow us to share good practices and experience our unique program that promotes the rule of law and implementation of the SDGs. So without the co cooperation, vision and support of the government of the state of Qatar, we wouldn't be able to have these results. And so I'm pleased to give the floor to a major player in the development and also the execution of the global program. His Excellency Major General Dr. Abdullah Amal, advisor to the Prime Minister and Minister of Interior of the state of Qatar. Thank you, John. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Madam Justice Minister, Madam Executive Director, UNODC, thank you so much for your kind words towards the state of Qatar. The Doha Global Program is a journey full of activities and experience, and we are so fortunate to witness these experiences. No doubt, without the UNODC's expertise and partnership, we couldn't be able to achieve this success. And I would like to let the person who dedicated his full time and his commitment for the global program since beginning to talk about it in a brief. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to introduce His Excellency General Dr. Abdullah Almal, the legal advisor to His Excellency the Minister of the Interior of State of Qatar and the chairman of the Doha Global Declaration Program follow-up committee to, the, to deliver his virtual statement to this high session. Okay, while we're waiting for, we have two videos which we were going to show you. One was the statement of uh, General Amal, which we will come back to. And also we have a statement from the president of the 75th session of the UN General Assembly. So we will come back to those videos while we fix the technical issues. And, um, and now I thought as we wait, we will turn to, we have a, several very distinguished speakers who are joining us today and they are joining us live and uh, they include His Excellency Mr. Shermatov Shirzad Hadamovic, who is the Minister of Public Education and Republic of Uzbekistan. We have the Honorable Franz Kapofi, the, the Minister of Home Affairs, Immigration, Safety and Security of the Republic of Namibia and our friend Ms. Stefania Giannini, the Assistant Director General of UNESCO, uh, the Honorable Justice Ad Adrian Saunders, the President of the Caribbean Court of Justice and member of the Advisory Board of the Global Judicial Integrity Network and some youth representatives. And so I will turn to our first panelist, who's His Excellency Mr. Shermatov Shirzad Adamovich. The Minister of Public Education from the Republic of Uzbekistan, and he'll share how his country has become a key partner and friend of the global program. Across several areas, Uzbekistan has become one of our showcase countries. We are grateful for this partnership and very proud of our joint work and engaging youth through education and sports-based interventions, building their resilience to violence and crime. So Excellency, you have the floor. Dear distinguished delegates, guests and partners of the 14th UN Congress on Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice. Today, it's an honor for me to share with you the experience that Uzbekistan has as a result of fruitful cooperation with the UN Office on Drugs and Crime within the framework of a national partnership. The Doha Declaration supported by the state of Qatar and the further implementation of the global program to help countries achieve a positive and sustainable impact on crime prevention, criminal justice, fight against corruption, and the promotion of the rule of law, 
gave its fruitful results in the Republic of Uzbekistan as well. We closely worked with the UNODC in Uzbekistan under the Education for Justice and the Crime Prevention through sport initiatives with great results. As you may know, the implementation of the Education for Justice initiative for primary and secondary school students to promote the rule of law among youth includes tools to fight corruption, prevent violent extremism, develop critical thinking skills, integrity, and support youth in addressing ethical and moral dilemmas. Of course, the formation of social, cultural, and spiritual skills in children and young people should start from childhood. Therefore, it's imperative that children become familiar with and have general knowledge of the rule of law at an early stage. To help achieve this goal, the Education for Justice Initiative focuses on promoting and educating the elementary level values such as benevolence, honesty and integrity, respect and fairness. The teaching materials of this initiative will help build life skills in children and young people. Moreover, through sport-based in interventions and the line, line Up, Live Up program, we help our youth to develop skills in conflict resolution, critical thinking, teamwork, and empathy. These values and skills are essential in prevention of crime and violence among young people, will assist children in solving ethical dilemmas, and sport can be a powerful tool to teach them these values. The Line Up, Live Up Uzbek curriculum was the, adapted to the national context together with experts from the Ministry of Education, who then accredited and officially registered the curriculum, enabling the scaling up process. The Line Up Live Up program has been already piloted in over 40 schools across the country, and we will be going to expand it further. Distinguished delegates, it should be noted that the ideas put forward by the Education for Justice Initiative and the Line Up Live Up program played an important role in the process of developing and introducing a new subject, upbringing, into the curriculum of secondary schools of the Republic of Uzbekistan. The main purpose of the subject is the development of personal qualities in students and youth, the formation of social and cultural life skills. The subject will cover students from grades 1 to 11. In view of the epidemiological situation that has arisen in connection with the coronavirus pandemic, in accordance with the decision of the Special Government Commission, since March of 2020, the Ministry of Public Education launched the online TV school project. Thus, students are able to continue their learning by watching special video lessons broadcasted on TV channels. Taking into account the relevance of the topics covered by the animated series, Thorps, it was decided to broadcast it to primary school students within the framework of online TV school. As well as through the official uh, web channels of the ministry in three languages, Uzbek, Russian and English. With an audience of 6 million students, including more than 2 million primary school students, the cartoon received many positive reviews from both teachers and parents and students. Thanks to the first launch and the feedback received by the expert commission of the ministry, an initiative was put forward to include the video series Zorbs in a new school subject as well. To date, all episodes of the animated Zorbs series are successfully integrated in the upbringing textbook for the first grade with the QR links in Uzbek and Russian. This fact once again underlines the general similarity of the values that we, together with you, are trying to instill in our children, which of course makes us happy. The Line Up Live Up program on building life skills through sport to build youth resilience to crime, violence, and drug use. So far, three trainings of trainers were held, reaching 80 teachers who then delivered the program to over 1,000 youth across the country. The Line Up Live Up program was integrated by the Minister of Education in the curriculum of secondary schools, which is a success for the sustainability and scalability of the program, and more importantly, to promote an approach to preventing youth crime, which focuses on providing opportunities for development rather than focusing on law enforcement responses. 
national video campaign featuring Olympic champions on the use of sport to build youth resilience to crime and violence, which broadcasted on national TV, reached an audience of 1.5 million as well. Online sport challenge to engage youth in positive activities and promote healthy coping mechanism to face challenges related to COVID-19 with over 8,000 submission videos by youth. Dear participants, it should be separately noted that this of course is not the only project implemented in cooperation with the UN Office on Drugs and Crime. For more than eight years, the ministry together with the UN Office on Drugs and Crime has been implemented a number of large scale projects and programs primarily aimed at preventing crime and drug use among students, building their life skills, improving legal culture and promoting a healthy lifestyle. In conclusion, I would like to take a note that Uzbekistan fully supports the directions of UN ODC in the field of crime prevention and criminal justice. We reaffirm our commitment and strong political will to support effective, fair, humane and accountable criminal justice systems and institutions. We emphasize that education for all children and youth, including eradicating illiteracy, is fundamental to preventing crime and corruption and to fostering a culture of rule of law that upholds the rule of law and human rights while respecting cultural identity. Sport as well offers an important tool for informal education, skills development and learning that includes teaching respect for human rights and diversity, fostering critical thinking and developing the behavioral and social emotional skills that can build youth resilience. In this regard, we also emphasize the fundamental role of the participation of young people as well as educational institutions in crime prevention efforts. In this regard, and in the conclusion of my speech, I would like to express my gratitude to, to our great partner, to our dear partners and colleagues, as well as special thanks to Ms. Ashita Mittal, Regional Representative in Central Asia, for many years of cooperation, friendly support, and those ideas that are ultimately highly appreciated among the direct beneficiaries, teachers, students, and their parents. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Minister. Thank you for joining us today. And also thank you to the UN, you mentioned the UNODC office in Central Asia and Ashita and her team, which have helped us as other field offices around the world in implementing uh, aspects of the global program. So we're going to now, hopefully we've, we've resolved our our technical issues, we're going to move now to the video of General Amal. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ashabu al-Sa'adah al-Musharikun al-Kiram. Smahu li an abda bil-ta'bir an shukri wa taqdiri li sa'adah al-mudira al-tanfidhiya li maktab al-Mamu al-Muttahid al-Ma'ani bil-Mukhaddarat wal-Jarima. Al-Sayyida qal li wali wa lil-Mas'uleen fi al-Maktab wa akhussu bimunhum bil-Dhikr al-Sayyid جون براندورينو والسيد ماركو تشيرا على جهودهم الكبيرة لتحقيق أقصى إنجازات ممكنة للبرنامج العالمي لتنفيذ إعلان الدوحة والذين استطاعوا حتى في ظروف جائحة كورونا تحقيق التقدم وتحقيق الإنجازات من خلال مبادرات خلاقة مع الشركاء عبر العالم واستنادا إلى النظرة بعيدة المدى لحضرة صاحب السمو الشيخ تميم بن حمد آل ثاني أمير البلاد المفدى وإيمانا من دولة قطر بالتعددية والتعاون الدولي والتضامن ومن أجل البناء على إنجازات المؤتمر الثالث عشر لمنع الجريمة الذي عقد في الدوحة في إبريل من عام 2015 فقد قررت دولة قطر إطلاق البرنامج العالمي لتنفيذ إعلان الدوحة بالتعاون مع مكتب الأمم المتحدة المعني بالمخدرات والجريمة في عام 2016 بهدف تحويل التعهدات السياسية في إعلان الدوحة إلى مشاريع على الأرض وكان للبرنامج العالمي لإعلان الدوحة ميزات كثيرة منها أنه أكبر برنامج ينفذه مكتب الأمم المتحدة المعني بالمخدرات والجريمة تموله دولة واحدة وأنها المرة الأولى في تاريخ مؤتمرات منع الجريمة يتحول فيها الإعلان السياسي للمؤتمر إلى أساس لبرنامج عملي لمساعدة الدول وخاصة الدول النامية للتصدي للتحديات التي تفرضها الجريمة المنظمة والفساد والمخدرات والإرهاب 
من خلال أربعة ركائز هي التعليم والرياضة ونزاهة القضاء وإعادة تأهيل السجناء واستطاع البرنامج العالمي لتنفيذ إعلان الدوحة أن يحدث أثرا واضحا في مجالات منع الجريمة والعدالة الجنائية ودعم تحقيق أهداف خطة التنمية المستدامة للأمم المتحدة 2030 لقد قدم البرنامج العالمي لتنفيذ إعلان الدوحة منظورا تطلعيا بشأن تنفيذ خطة التنمية المستدامة 2030 في جانبين رئيسيين الأول هو أنه دعم تحقيق أهداف خطة التنمية المستدامة وبالذات الأهداف أرقام ثلاثة وأربعة وخمسة وتسعة وعشرة وأحد عشر وستة عشر وسبعة عشر والثاني هو أنه نفذ سياسات وبراج وبرامج تدعم التنمية الاقتصادية الاجتماعية وتبني مؤسسات شفافة وذات مصداقية وقادرة على الصمود وبهذا وضع موضع التطبيق المبدأ القائل أن سيادة القانون والتنمية المستدامة مترابطتان, مترابطتان ويعزز كل منهم الآخر إننا سعداء بأن أنشطة البرنامج العالمي الذي يتضمن أنشطة أنشطة بناء القدرات والمساعدة التغنية وصلت إلى مليونين ونصف المليون شخص من أكثر من 190 دولة وأن أكثر من 1.4 مليون طالب استفادوا من المواد التعليمية للبرنامج و170 ألف شخص استفادوا من أنشطة بناء القدرات وأن الشبكة العالمية لنزاهة القضاء أطلقت في إبريل 2018 ضمن أنشطة البرنامج أصحاب السعادة إن دولة قطر فخورة بإنجازات البرنامج العالمي لتنفيذ إعلان الدوحة وتشجع الدول الأعضاء على أن تعتبر هذا البرنامج نموذجا في دعمها المستقبلي لمكتب الأمم المتحدة المعني بالمخدرات والجريمة وهذا ما حثت عليه الفقرة 55 من إعلان كيوتو شاكرا حسن استماعكم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Thank you uh, Major General Dr. Abdullah Al-Mal General Al-Mal as I mentioned was uh, a main player in the development and implementation of the global program he was one of the chairs of the follow-up committee that was created to, to follow progress of the program and discuss strategies and paths. So we thank him for joining us today. And we also are proud of our joint achievements of the global program and look forward to our continued cooperation as we move ahead in this decade of action. And now, uh, excellencies and distinguished delegates, I'm pleased to give the floor uh, to another distinguished uh, speaker who will be joining us by video, His Excellency Mr. Volkan Bozkur, who is the president of the 75th session of the UN General Assembly to deliver his remarks. And let's turn to, uh, to Mr. Bozkar. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I thank the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime and the government of Japan for inviting me to participate in this important event. Today's discussion is a testament to the agility of the United Nations in implementing the Doha Declaration as adopted in Resolution 70-174. The General Assembly recognized that crime prevention, criminal justice, and the rule of law are global issues which require a multilateral response. UNODC met this call for action by creating the Doha Declaration Global Program, supported by the Government of Qatar, which translates policy directives and recommendations into concrete measurable results. The success of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development hinges upon our commitment to programs such as this. We cannot build equal, just, and peaceful societies without initiatives such as the Global Judicial Integrity Network. Furthermore, your work on prisoner rehabilitation is to preventing recidivism. I applaud the skills training you are doing with prisoners in line with the Nelson Mandela rules on the treatment of prisoners. I also welcome your actions both in policy and practice during the COVID-19 pandemic, including the provision of hygiene kits to prisoners. 
COVID-19 has, of course, made the path to 2030 more arduous. However, we cannot allow the pandemic to derail our efforts. We must pay particular attention to young people coming of age in this tumultuous period who may feel disillusioned. Indeed, the impact of crime and violence has a life-changing impact on youth, both as victims and perpetrators of crimes. I commend the Youth Crime Prevention Through Sport Initiative, which offers an alternative path away from crime, violence, and drug use. We cannot underestimate sense of community, safety, and confidence gained from participating in sport. Furthermore, the Education for Justice program has assisted more than one and a half million children and young people from 187 countries to understand and address issues that can undermine the rule of law. Excellencies, there is much work to do in this decade of action to implement sustainable development. However, your work on the promotion of the rule of law and justice has laid the foundation for a better world for all. Working together, we can succeed in tackling crime and leaving no one behind. I thank you. And thank you for those remarks to the President of the General Assembly. The Doha Declaration uh, highlighted the importance of bolstering measures to support the rehabilitation and social integration of prisoners into the community, which has been mentioned by a number of speakers. And UNODC, within the framework of a dedicated component of the global program, has supported member states in establishing a more rehabilitative approach to prison management by developing programs in the three core areas of education, voca vocational training, and work in prisons to contribute to the social reintegration of prisoners upon their release. And actually, one of the key partners in this field has been Nam Namibia. And to speak about the country's experience, we will now give the floor uh, via taped message to the Honorable Franz Kapofi, who is the Minister of Home Affairs, Immigration, Safety and Security for the Republic of Namibia. So let's turn to that video, please. His Excellency Mr. Volkan Boskar, President of the United Nations General Assembly, Mrs. Kada Wali, Executive Director, UNODC, Major General Dr. Abdullah Yusuf Al Mal, Advisor to the Minister of Interior of Qatar, fellow panelists, ladies and gentlemen. Namibia is thankful for the opportunity to participate in this special event, organized as part of the 4th, 14th Crime Congress. We believe that the outcome of this event and the Congress as a whole will have a major impact on the crime prevention and criminal justice system globally. Since the adoption of the Doha Declaration, at the 13th Crime Congress and as part of the framework of the prisoner rehabilitation component of the UNODC's global program for the implementation of the Doha Declaration, Namibia remains one of the countries that continue to benefit greatly under the global program. This collaboration between Namibia and the UNODC has assisted in addressing some of the country's challenges to meet the Sustainable Development Goals. As most of the work done with the UNODC under this program falls within offender rehabilitation, I will focus on Namibia's success stories and highlight the innovative ways in which we endeavor to improve the lives of offenders in Namibia, including tackling the COVID-19 pandemic in our correctional facilities. Fellow panelists, ladies and gentlemen, the Namibian Correctional Services has since 2005 transformed from an essentially punitive system to a professionalized correctional service. 
embracing a scientific and evidence-based approach to offender management and rehabilitation. I will now enumerate some innovative ways through which this program has enhanced Namibia's rehabilitation of offenders before their reintegration into the community. One, the expansion in 2020 of the Winter Correctional Facilities Soap Manufacturing Project to start producing hand sanitizers to mitigate the spread of COVID-19 among offenders and the general public. Two, assisting with the setting up of the hydroponics projects at the Gobabis Correctional Facility in collaboration with the World Food Program. Three, establishing the Greetings Cards project at the Wolfers Bay Correctional Facility. Four, boasting the female sender of the window correctional facilities basket making project with additional sewing equipment. Five, providing medical equipment to the clinic in the female center to make it a fully fledged health facility. For Namibia, these projects are an effort to provide offenders with necessary vocational skills for self-sufficiency and make them employable upon release. This will furthermore reduce the chance of recidivism. This speaks to the fact that Namibia continues to implement the Nelson Mandela rules, the international benchmark for the treatment of offenders. In conclusion, I wish to express on behalf of the government and people of Namibia our appreciation to the UNODC, the Global Programme for the Implementation of the Doha Declaration and the State of Qatar for availing technical assistance for the Roadmap for Prison Rehabilitation Programme and improving the lives of offenders for a better Namibia. We look forward to the second phase of the Global Programme to expand UNODC support as a result of the Kyoto Declaration. And I thank you. Thanks to Mr. Minister for those comments, particularly as a strong partner in our component on prisoner rehabilitation. And another component of the global program, actually an important component is education, and particularly what's known as the Education for Justice Initiative where we seek to use education as a crime prevention tool on all levels, wh whether it be secondary, primary, um, and or tertiary levels of education. And our next speaker is one of the global program's key UN partners in education generally and in achieving goal four, which is quality education of the SDGs. Through our joint partnership with UNESCO, we have built bridges between education and crime prevention and criminal justice while also developing important tools for policymakers and teachers worldwide. So with that, I'm pleased to, to introduce someone who's been a strong advocate of our partnership and has worked with us closely over the past two years or so, uh, Ms. Stefania Giannini, who is UNESCO's Assistant Director General for Education. So let's turn to Stefania's video. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of UNESCO, it's a great pleasure to participate in this special event on promoting the rule of law and justice. Well, uh, allow me to start by quoting uh, UN Secretary General, uh, who recently stated that Quoting, the world is facing a pandemic of human rights abuses. As governments respond to the COVID-19 pandemic, it's absolutely critical that they uphold uh, the rule of law and respect international human rights standards. The crisis has highlighted that young people need to know their rights and they need to demand uh, that they have held when curtailed beyond the street necessary. But if young people are not aware of their fundamental rights, uh, how can they exercise them? Education uh, has a fundamental role to play in teaching awareness of human rights and empowering youth to become proactive contributors to a more just, peaceful and sustainable world. 
This is the message that came loud and clear in UNESCO recent public survey on the world in 2030. Education was selected by more than uh, 15,000 respondents as one of the top solutions to address global challenges to peaceful societies and in particular violence and crime. Education, we know, can transform societies. When young people develop an appreciation for justice for, from an early age in schools, when they know how to exercise their rights, when they are given the opportunity to make a difference, well, they can move the world. UNESCO is on the front line to promote justice and the rule of law through its work on global citizenship education and target 4.7 of the sustainable development goal number four. This target promotes, we know, humanistic and transformative vision of education. With, with the UN on DC, we are helping education ministries to respond to current threats and emerging crises by putting people and their rights at the core, at the center of our action plan. We place emphasis on the most vulnerable groups. The collaborative effort contributes to the implementation of the Doha Declaration Global Program. And let me express my deep gratitude to the state of Qatar for making this possible. We are proud of what we have built together in the last three years. It's about working with policymakers and educators to build bridges between the education and the justice sectors. We have promoted transformational pedagogies for teachers and educators. Uh, using our interactive handbooks on empowering students for just societies. We have empowered young people to become real change makers in their communities, such as recently done in Lebanon. During the Congress, UNESCO and UNODC will organize an event on countering violent narratives through education with the spotlight on youth. We will release a joint documentary, Youth Can Move the World, to celebrate how youth are promoting just societies through education. Thanks to our joint efforts, I trust that we can accompany a new generation to defend their rights and engage in creating more just societies. I thank you. I thank you very much for your attention and wish a successful Congress. Merci beaucoup, shukran, arigato. Thank you to Stefania for those comments and for our partnership with UNESCO. And another component of the global program has been our judicial integrity work, including the creation of a global judicial integrity network. And the next speaker, Honorable Justice Adrian Saunders, the president of the Caribbean Court of Justice since July 2018, is a member of the management committee of the Caribbean Association of Judicial Officers, a former Chief Justice of the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court and a board member, as I mentioned, of the Global and Judicial Integrity Network. And it's over three years since existence, the network has succeeded in creating a truly global community and movement of judges, judiciaries and other stakeholders, such as regional and international associations, institutions, academia and UN bodies join for the common vision and purpose. And the network promotes the exchange of experiences through the development of various knowledge products and tools and platforms on pertinent integrity related issues and creates numerous face-to-face -face and virtual networking and knowledge sharing opportunities, which are used quite often by uh, judges from many countries around the world, over hundred countries. Its website serves as a global hub on integrity related topics and provides innovative and informative features, including an online library, podcast series, opinion pieces, webinars, and more. So I have the pleasure now to turn to the taped remarks, video remarks of uh, Justice Saunders. I'm very pleased to make this presentation on behalf of the advisory board of the Global Judicial Integrity Network at this 14th United Nations Congress on Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice. And I express my deep appreciation to the organizers for the invitation to address you and to be able to present in this manner. As we all know, 
Article 11 of the United Nations Convention Against Corruption emphasizes the crucial role of the judiciary in combating corruption. Article 11 recognizes that in order to play this role effectively, members of the judiciary must themselves act with integrity and professionalism. Judicial integrity is critical to the rule of law and to public trust and confidence in the administration of justice. It is, for example, through their judgments in key areas such as corruption, environmental protection, measures for poverty alleviation, the right to education, that on a daily basis, judges enable the achievement of the sustainable development goals. For many years, the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime has been providing assistance to member states in strengthening judicial integrity. The establishment of the Global Judicial Integrity Network in April 2018 has, however, marked a significant expansion and deepening of UNODC's work. Judges now have a unique space to discuss challenges and to find solutions, a space that never existed in the UN and one that should continue to be strengthened. The Global Judicial Integrity Network is an integral part of the Doha Declaration Global Program. And so it is only fitting that I should acknowledge the tremendous generosity of the state of Qatar for its financial support in this regard. The specific focus of the Integrity Network is on boosting judicial integrity throughout the world. The network promotes networking opportunities, facilitates access to resources, it supports the development of technical and teaching tools, as well as it provides broad assistance to judiciaries across the world. The ever-expanding network pursues these aims by enlisting the participation of judges on its advisory board to assist in the identification of priority challenges and emerging issues in judicial integrity and to guide the development of the work plan of the network based on the priorities identified. Individually, advisory board members play a key role in inspiring and stimulating judiciaries and judicial officers in their respective corners of the world to advance judicial integrity and the mission of the network. The network brings judges together under the banner of judicial ethics, professionalism, and accountability. A little over a year ago, just before the pandemic consumed us all, the network, in conjunction with the state of Qatar, organized a high-level event in Doha, attended by 700 judges and judicial experts drawn from 118 countries, making it the largest UN gathering of judges ever. This was the second such high-level event at which judges throughout the world were able to meet face-to-face -face with other judicial practitioners and experts to share ideas and good practices and deepen or establish new and valuable ties. It is through the convening power of the network that all of this was made possible. The high-level event was only one way in which the network facilitates knowledge sharing and in which it reinforces and stimulates its engagement with and among judges. It actually accomplishes these objectives in a wide variety of other ways as well. The network's interesting and interactive website, www.unodc.org slash GI, allows access to podcasts and articles from experts around the world. These short pieces give influential judges and experts a platform to address current issues and views on how judiciaries and society in general are responding to daily challenges that implicate judicial integrity. The network's online library serves as a repository of all forms of resources developed by judiciaries. Each judiciary is encouraged to make its resources available for the common benefit of network participants. And so from Afghanistan to Zimbabwe, 
it is possible to access, compare, and learn from a range of resources developed in the various nations of the world community. One of the more important legacies of the network is the practical guidance it develops for judges on current issues. Judicial integrity is conditioned by time and space, and judicial standards cannot be frozen forever. The network strives to keep abreast of emerging scientific, technological, social, and cultural norms. For example, the world has witnessed significant developments in our appreciation of various aspects of gender discrimination and also in the use of artificial intelligence and social media. With the involvement of judges and relevant experts worldwide, the network has fashioned very helpful guidelines for judges on these problematic areas. These guidelines are by no means rigid prescriptions, but they serve to indicate areas of widespread concern and they present guidance on how to navigate these challenges. I have faith that the network will continue to guide us as new challenges present themselves. The network collaborates with judicial bodies both to assist them in establishing or revising codes of conduct and in training their judges on judicial ethics. In this regard, a set of teaching tools has been developed by the network to assist trainers. But even where a judicial officer is unable to benefit from organized training, such as, for example, during the ongoing pandemic, the network's website allows a judge to take at her own pace and in her own time an interactive e-learning course an e-learning course that teaches judges to recognize when judicial conduct and ethical issues come into play, both within and outside the workplace. One measure of the success of any initiative is the extent to which it makes a difference. The network has made a huge difference over the course of just three years. It's done so through its innovation, and through its worldwide reach. It has quickly developed itself into a global hub, a hub around which judicial training is promoted and facilitated, a hub to which judges may turn for good practices, new ideas, rich resources, and tools, and a hub for promoting high ethical standards among judges. I am pleased and very proud to be associated with the network which has provided a very powerful and much needed platform for judges. Unlike any other, the dedicated and hardworking staff members at the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime have done an excellent job in cementing the role of the network in the advancement of judicial integrity globally for years to come. I thank you very much. That was a nice testimonial from Justice Saunders about the work under the Global Inte Judicial Integrity Network. Uh, and, and one final component of the program is working with youth and particularly using sports to provide life lessons to youth and allow them to make the right choices and use the right, uh, have learn the right practices to be able to avoid crime and as a crime prevention tool. And so what we will finish our, our, get our list of speakers today by listening to some of the voices of the next generation and those who have, who have inspired us, but has also, also have been inspired by the program. So if we can turn to that, those recorded messages. Ser parte de la Iniciativa de Educación para la Justicia me ha permitido contribuir en la promoción de la cultura de paz, el Estado de Derecho, además de la prevención del delito y la violencia orientado a niños, niñas y jóvenes 
sin duda esta estrategia y esta herramienta, eh, el aplicarla de manera presencial y además de manera virtual en el contexto generado por la COVID-19, ha sido una gran oportunidad para poder mostrar mis habilidades y además poder desarrollarme personal y profesionalmente. Como joven, tuve la oportunidad de participar en la iniciativa Educación para la Justicia, articulando con gobiernos locales y regionales, coordinando también con escuelas y sus directivos, la Policía Nacional y la sociedad en su conjunto. De la mano de mis compañeros y compañeras, pudimos aplicar diferentes herramientas educativas a través de talleres, los cuales, en primer lugar, nos han ayudado de manera personal y profesionalmente a conocer los diversos problemas que aquejan a los niños, niñas, jóvenes y adolescentes del Perú. La aplicación de estas herramientas nos permitió a nosotros como jóvenes tener contacto directo con todos los actores involucrados en el proceso debido a que utilizamos un enfoque holístico e inclusivo involucrando a padres de familia, organizaciones de la sociedad civil, además de instituciones gubernamentales como Barrio Seguro del Ministerio del Interior, la Secretaría Nacional de la Juventud del Ministerio de Educación, municipalidades y además gobiernos regionales, entre otros. Mi experiencia dentro de la iniciativa Educación para la Justicia ayudó a empoderarme, pudiendo ser así un agente de cambio, ayudando a construir una sociedad más justa, libre, segura y equitativa. Asimismo, este trabajo articulado logró ayudar a los estudiantes de pasar a aprender sobre el Estado de Derecho y las formas de riesgo delictivo, a actuar como agentes de cambio comprometiéndose con valores y responsabilidades basados en los derechos humanos, siendo capaces y además de ser partícipes de la construcción de un espacio mucho más seguro, sano y productivo. Promoviendo así una cultura de paz y legalidad a través de la prevención de la violencia y el delito. Todo ello gracias a la educación, enfatizando esta última como una herramienta integral para el desarrollo. Ser parte de la Iniciativa de Educación para la Justicia me ha permitido tener una mirada distinta y diversa a todos los problemas sociales que quejan los jóvenes. Asimismo me permite y me permitirá más adelante desarrollar políticas públicas mucho más inclusivas pensadas en el bienestar y la seguridad de las personas. Thank you to two, um, two of many youth that have participated in the programs related to, uh, to the global program. So now I, um, since we're getting toward the end of our session, I want, we've finished all our uh, scheduled speakers. I would like to give the floor to uh, Mr. Marco Texera, who is currently the chief of the global program and he steered the program to a number of successes over the past years, and he will uh, lead this part of our event and provide some reflections uh, on his own, particularly his direct uh, experience with the program. Marco, you have the floor. Thank you, Director John Brandolino, Ambassador Al Mansuri, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, our partners, it is a pleasure to be with you today to conclude this special event at the occasion of the 14th United Nations Congress on Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice. This event demonstrated how member states, the United Nations system, and other relevant stakeholders can actively and innovatively promote the rule of law and justice among children, youth, and people from all over the world. I want to thank you, all of our distinguished speakers and panelists who brought their remarkable expertise to this event and provided the audience with practical experiences on how to promote rule of law and justice and how our activities, our initiatives at national, regional, international level are part of their efforts. Our distinguished panelists shared a detailed description of, on, on how the program's activities impacted member states and individuals around the globe and highlighted the importance of rule of law towards the decade of action. This event took us all on a journey from Doha through Vienna while traveling the, the globe to Kyoto, allowing a reflection on good practices and experiences that resulted from the activities of the global program for the implementation of the Doha Declaration and its four components. Thanks to the generous contribution of the state of Qatar, we made the program a reality. Upon the inception of the program, UNODC 
and the state of Qatar had a clear goal, which was to go beyond translating policy into action, but also to inspire many of our beneficiaries to act for the rule of law and achieving a sustainable, long-lasting impact. Over the last five years, the program work, worked intensively and strategically, while mainstreaming and human rights and gender perspective into its activities. We worked with our partners from all over the world to realize a joint vision to the member states and reflect and put DOA declaration into reality. I'm proud to be here today with my colleagues and my fantastic team, the state of Qatar and our partners to celebrate the fact that we have exceeded the original target set in 2015, as you can see in the shared slide. The lives of over 2.5 million people from over 190 countries benefited from our efforts, our activities and our joint vision. The legacy of the global program is, however, in my perspective, greater than figures and achievements that I just mentioned and you can see in the slide. It goes beyond those numbers. It's also based on personal stories of individuals, children, youth who have benefited from the program. Are these personal histories the our driving force that inspires UNODC and I assume also the state of Qatar, as well as numerous of our partners to continue to upscale our efforts to promote rule of law while demonstrating the agility to address new challenges and I'm convinced that with the reverberated efforts, we can pave a way to a sustainable recovery from the pandemic. A key factor of the success of the global program is to focus on partnerships, multilingualism, and leaving no one behind. These were the enabled factors for the program capacity to implement and deliver even during the current challenging times. Since the adoption of the DOA Declaration, numerous resolutions on education, judicial integrity, youth crime prevention and rehabilitation of prisoners have been endorsed by the General Assembly, which demonstrates the importance of those topics and the role of UNODC in supporting member states. Today was adopted the Kyoto Declaration, which provides further impetus to the aspiration of the member states in these important areas that I just mentioned. From our perspective, I look forward to continue our partnership with the state of Qatar and the member states to build upon the legacy of the global program towards a sustainable impact in the years to come. A special word of appreciation for His Excellency Ambassador al Mansouri for his continuous support and his presence here is also another signal of his commitment and the commitment of the state of Qatar. To conclude, I'm encouraged by the outcome of this special event and by the 14th Crime Congress. And to finalize, as our Secretary General once said, there is no other way to deal with global challenges than with global responses. I trust that our common vision for the promotion of rule of law and justice, our joint global efforts and responses will enable a transformational change while leaving a better societies for the future and for the future generations. Thank you. Director, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. So I, I we're coming to our closing. I, I uh, too want to wish everyone for joining us today. As our speakers and panelists have demonstrated the 13th Crime Congress and the Doha Declaration paved the way to make the rule of law a whole of society issue. Implementing the, this global program, we have witnessed the potential of the Congress's political will to benefit people throughout the world. As we come to Kyoto, we face some of the continuing challenges, but also some different and new challenges ahead of us. And our success also shows that we can leave the Congresses with renewed hope, especially in taking a multi-dimensional approach to promote the rule of law in the last decade of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. I want to thank all of those who contributed to the program, not only those panelists today that have shared experiences, but those who are many more that really uh, hundreds of thousands that we 
obviously have benefited and have joined us in, in the course of the program that could not have an opportunity to speak. Uh, we, we want to thank all our partner organizations, and particularly the state of Qatar for its inspiration, its vision and its support. And uh, Ambassador Al-Mansouri, thank you for being here with us and also introducing uh, General Amal and his, his contribution. And I want to, uh, to leave this, uh, this discussion with hope, hope that we can move forward from the 14th Crime Congress with a similar vision, a similar resolve to take action and to move forward together uh, to, for the benefit of crime prevention and criminal justice throughout the world. So thank you and uh, good afternoon to everyone. Good evening, good night, wherever you are. Thank you.